Okay. So where are we at on the body here? I'm watching that. Yeah, scalp. Good. You can tell it's scalp right away because you've got big antigen hairs that have their roots way down in the fat. Sometimes you can also see big deep hairs like this in the genital area or in the axilla. But most of the time when I see a lot of hairs and their roots are down deep, scalp, sideburn, somewhere close. And someone very nicely pointed out that it looks like an organoid nevus or, um, or a nevus sebaceous, depending on what name you like. And basically, yes, a, it's a hamartomatous process here. We've got um, acanthosis of the epidermis. We got a lesion here I'll talk about in a minute, but we've got epidermal acanthosis. And we also importantly have normal hairs, normal hairs, hairs are gone. And then the normal hairs come back. So in organoid nevus, epithelial nevus, nevus sebaceous, all of these things kind of uh, overlapping, you often have um, a thickening or acanthosis of the epidermis, often with a kind of wart or seborrheic keratosis-like pattern. And then you have loss of the underlying hairs normally. So kind of a patch of alopecia it, along with the, uh, the lesion. And yes, a nevus sebaceous, for some reason, doesn't have an O in it. I imagine there's some long Latin story uh, there. But anyway, I, I always like to joke that it's, a, it's like a code word that if you, if you put the O in there, then the dermatologist will know you're not a real derm path. It's like a, it's a trick. So if you know there's a couple words in, in um, a dermatopathology of derm diseases that you have to leave the O out, like, or, or like lichen sclerosus. It has sclerosis with an I in the dermis, but the name is lichen sclerosus with a U. So I, again, I'm sure there's that actual good Latin declension based reason for this but it's kind of ridiculous and it's okay. I've, uh, the O gets put in there because I cannot teach my dictating software to, to recognize, I just have to auto correct it. So it's okay, don't, don't, don't feel shame, it's all good. All right, so that's a nice clue right away when I see loss of the hairs and it's from the scalp of a kid, right away I'm thinking of nevus sebaceous, then oftentimes again with the epidermal acanthosis. And another little clue that's sometimes present is you'll find um, apocrine or apocrine glands, whichever way you like to say it, underneath uh, the lesion. They're not always present, but when you see them, that's pretty helpful because apocrine glands don't normally exist in the normal scalp. They're normally limited to the anogenital area and also the glands of mole along the eyelids and um, random exceptions to that, but in general, you're not gonna see them on the scalp skin. So if I see um, apocrine glands, or sometimes it'll actually be glands that look like eccrine glands, but have kind of larger apocrine looking nuclei with little punctate nucleoli. So apoecrine glands, some people call them. Those are all nice clues for nevus sebaceus. I've got a whole video about nevus sebaceus that you can go and nerd out over if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but here, what we're gonna talk about is this lesion and <clears throat> it often arises in the setting of nevus sebaceus. And this is, um, this is an example of what? Yeah, this is scap, syringocystadenoma papilliferum. That's why we call it scap, because it's a ridiculously long name. What you have is cystic spaces with papillae. So similar to, I mean, in a way, that, that's that same kind of thing that we see in the um, in digital papillary adenocarcinoma. But the big differences here are, number one, this lesion essentially always arises from the epidermis and grows down. Whereas I don't think that I've ever actually seen a digital papillary adenocarcinoma connect to the epidermis that I can recall. They are, to me, always dermal or subcutis uh, based lesions that are separate from the epidermis, essentially always that I can, I mean, I'm sure someone's reported one, but I don't think I've ever seen one, and I've seen quite a few of those. Um, so syringocystadenoma papilliferum has this, um, this invaginating channels that come down and then kind of push down into the dermis. They're lined by double layer columnar or cuboidal cells that often have little kind of apocrine snouting on the surface. You get like kind of a little uh, basal layer and then the little apical layer here that has little snouts. See, isn't that cute little snouts? And then um, they, these, uh, these uh, bulging papillae that come into the lumen of these spaces. And in the stroma, in these papillae and around, usually you're gonna have tons of plasma cells. I'm not exactly sure why the plasma cells like this lesion so much, but they really do, they're usually present. So all of those things together are really helpful. And you, like I said, oftentimes if I see this, right away I start looking for nevus sebaceus in the background because it often grows in the setting of nevus sebaceus. And in fact, nevus sebaceus, because it's a hamartoma, 
it seems to be like a fertile, fertile garden for growing all sorts of different types of little adnexal tumor uh, weeds. So I've seen ones and sometimes I'll, I think I did put this in a report once, but, and no one, I didn't get in trouble for it, but I said it was a, a nevis sebaceous with a melange of benign adnexal tumors, or maybe I said an assortment, I can't remember, but I did basically, instead of listing off, because it was a general surgeon or a pediatric surgeon, and I thought, instead of me listing syringocystadenoma papilliferum, desmoplastic trichelomoma, trichoblastoma, I thought these are all going to sound highly scary to a non-dermatologist. I just said, this is a nevis sebaceous, and there's some benign adnexal growths in the background, and it's all good. No, no further treatment needed. Everyone was happy. So, um, so anyway, in nevis sebaceous, you know, stay on the lookout. You'll often find a variety of different little adnexal fun, fun goodies growing in the background, usually benign. Um, you know, in the olden days, people were concerned about basal cell carcinomas arising from uh, nevis sebaceous. I have seen uh, uh, one or two cases that I felt convincingly were true basal cell carcinoma, but I feel like the vast majority of basaloid things growing in the background of nevus sebaceous, in my experience, have been trichoepithelioma or trichoblastoma. So, um, and, and besides, even if they are basal cell carcinoma, you know, it's not like a basal cell carcinoma is going to be likely to cause this huge problem for the patient. So I sometimes see people worrying about, oh, we need to remove the nevus sebaceous because it could grow a cancer. Yes, it could, but I mean, even if it started changing, then you could take it out then. I, I think for people who want to remove nevus sebaceous, cool, no problem. But I don't feel like there's some real high risk of, of getting an aggressive malignancy. There are rare reports of apocrine carcinoma and some other types of carcinoma growing in nevus sebaceous that were aggressive and did result in, in death. But we also see those rarely occur in totally normal skin, right? So I'm not convinced that the risk is terribly high. I have seen one one example of a nasty African carcinoma that grew from a nevus sebaceous, and I think I may have seen one squame, if I recall, and they were both in adults, so that it had long-standing nevus sebaceous. So in any case, just throwing that out there for your, for your discretion. I, I know people, the derm residents always ask me this because it's supposedly it's something they're supposed to know for boards about what the most common tumor associated with nevus sebaceous is, and I don't actually know the answer because I don't know if the answer is supposed to be scap or if it's supposed to be trichoblastoma or what the actual proper answer is. There, I would say that the thing that I see most often is syringocystadenoma papilliferum. So for what it's worth.